Welcome everyone to the Global Environmental Change section, Early Career and Mid-Career Awards uh, webinar series part two. We already have our first webinar series um, in October. And if you missed that webinar, you can go to our Global Environmental Change section, um, connect.ag.org slash GEC. You can find the recordings from past webinar as well as the webinars from previous years um, to watch if you want some watch list during holidays. And today is our great pleasure to have our second uh, part of the uh, webinar series. And it's my pleasure to introduce the president of the Global Environment Change Section and the president-elect of the section. Uh, president is Dr. Julie brickman Gritty, and the president-elect is the Dr. Andy Dessler. And I will turn the mic to Julie. Okay, welcome everyone. And um, thank you for being here. And we're looking forward to AGU next week where we'll have our named lectures, the Tyndall lecture, the Snyder lecture, and the Bolin lecture. And so we invite you uh, either in person or virtually to take part in those. But today we're gonna celebrate our early career winners. Um, we have over the years um, uh, given out these awards uh, that are in recognition of both early career and mid-career um, scientists and recognize their outstanding contributions um, in research, education, societal impacts, and the area of global, global environmental change, especially in interdisciplinary approaches. So this year, we elected to have an, a lecture series to celebrate their research. And of course, these will be uh, uh, put on our website uh, for posterity. And so today we're going to um, start our, our program today with an introduction with um, uh, Dr. Bin Zhao, who is our, our third early career winner. And he's an assistant professor, School of the Environment at the Tsinghua University in, in Beijing, China. And he's being recognized for his research into the causes and numerical simulations of haze over eastern China. So Dr. Bin Zhao will, will speak first, and then we will have our mid-career winner who I will introduce um, just before he begins. So thank you um, and congratulations, Dr. Zhao, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Julie, uh, for your introduction and for hosting me in this webinar. Uh, today, I will talk about the aerosols in the climate system uh, from how they are initially formed to how they affect the clouds and the climate. The aerosols are everywhere in the Earth atmosphere, whether you are living in a big city like Beijing or in a relatively clean area like the Amazon, you are always breathing in a lot of uh, aerosol particles. Uh, these tiny particles are responsible for uh, 4.1 million premature deaths worldwide in just uh, 2019. Mm. Uh, so how are the, these uh, uh, tiny particles formed? Uh, so uh, some of them are directly emitted from uh, industrial plants, vehicles, etc. But most of them are uh, formed in the air from uh, condensable gases through a process called new particle formation, NPF. Traditionally, NPF uh, was thought to be uh, mainly triggered by sulfuric acid and uh, accelerated by ammonium. But recently, it was recognized that uh, amine and uh, low volatility organics may also play an important and even dominant role in NPF. However, the main mechanisms of NPF in many environments of the Earth are still poorly understood. In addition to NPF, the oxidation chemistry of oxidation chemistry is also key to the formation and evolution of aerosols. In this regard, we must pay attention to a secondary organic aerosol, SOA, because it's one of the largest but least understood aerosol components. The traditional theory presumes that uh, SOA is formed from the oxidation of volatile organic compounds, VOC. Uh, but there's growing evidence that the precursors of SOA may actually span the entire volatility range. Uh, 
these uh, precursors can uh, undergo multi-generational oxidation through various reaction pathways. It is necessary to uh, clarify the key precursors and formation processes or SOA in order to develop targeted control strategies. The aerosols once formed uh, can uh, significantly affect the Earth's climate by scattering and absorbing solar radiation and also by uh, serving as nuclei for the formation of cloud droplets or ice crystals. Uh, the last few IPCC reports all showed that aerosol cloud interactions is one of the largest uncertainties in the estimate of historical radiative forcing. Among all the cloud types, uh, so the interactions of aerosols with deep vacuum clouds and ice clouds are worthy of special attention uh, because the former uh, affects not only the radiative budgets but also heavy precipitation and the latter is uh, especially uncertain because the previous slides have shown uh, conflicting results. Uh, given the about knowledge gaps today, I will uh, try to partly uh, answer uh, uh, a few interrelated questions regarding the formation and the impacts of aerosols. First, uh, what are the mechanisms and the impacts of NPF in typical environments? And second, uh, what are the formation mechanisms of SOA in typical environments? And finally, so what are the factors uh, that govern the impact of aerosols on deep convective and ice clouds? So I'll begin with the uh, uh, NPF part. Uh, so, okay, so we address uh, all these uh, three questions through a combination of model simulations and observational data. Uh, a main challenge to represent uh, NPF in models is the high complexity of organic NPF. The organic NPF is triggered by ultra and extremely low volatility organics, short as ULVOC and ELVOC. However, the current 3D models cannot simulate the complicated formation chemistry of these compounds. To address this challenge, here we uh, employ the uh, no, a novel radical two-dimensional volatility basis set, R2DVBS framework. Uh, this framework was originally conceived by Neil Donahue's group. Uh, so this framework uh, groups all the organics into a 2D space, space uh, defined by volatility and the oxidation state. Uh, through the uh, movement of organics in this 2D space, uh, this framework uh, explicitly simulates the temperature-dependent formation chemistry of ULVOC and ELVOC from monoterpenes. This chemistry includes autoxidation, uh, dimerization, etc. Uh, uh, et uh, to make the 2D R2DVBS applicable to real-world conditions, we uh, updated the framework to consider the diversity of reaction rates and also developed optimal uh, parameterizations within the R2DVBS by simulating a series of laboratory experiments. And then we incorporated the R2DVBS as well as its optimal, optimal parameterizations in a regional model WolfCam and a global model E3SM. And we also incorporated in the two models an advanced nucleation scheme involving eight different NPF pathways, including four inorganic pathways, three organic pathways, and an amine plus sulfur acid pathway. The new WolfCam model has uh, significantly improved the particle number simulations over the Amazon. Uh, in these figures, the black line is the observa aircraft observations, which shows that the particle number concentration increases rapidly with altitude. And uh, the blue line is uh, the, the blue line is the simulations that does not consider any NPF, and the red line considers only inorganic NPF. These two cases substantially underestimate the particle number concentrations at high altitudes. And the sign line is our new model that simulates the organic NPF physically using the R2DVBS. Obviously, 
uh, our new model uh, successfully captures the high particle concentrations at high altitudes. The new, no the new model has allowed us to answer an intriguing questions. Uh, what are the sources of the enormous number of aerosols at high altitudes over such a clean areas like Amazon? Uh, we show that the pure organic MPF, that is the orange and the cyan color, dominates the particle formation above 13 kilometer. And the organic plus sulfuric acid MPF, the blue color, dominates between 8 and 13 kilometers. Uh, further, our global modeling using uh, the improved E3SM model uh, also show similar results regarding the uh, uh, MPF mechanisms over the Amazon, further corroborating our findings. Then we are wondering how much MPF contributes to CCN over the Amazon. Uh, we find that uh, within the uh, boundary layer, MPF contributes 80% of the CCN in the wet season, but contributes a much smaller fraction in the dry season because of the prevailing biomass burning. Uh, then an interesting finding is that most of the CCNs are not from local MPF, but from the transport of new particles formed elsewhere. Specifically, among the CCN due to MPF, 80% originates from the transport of remotely formed particles over 1,000 kilometers away. And uh, one-third to one-third to one-half originates from the downward transport of particles formed at high altitudes. Uh, then we uh, turn our attention to a polluted uh, area. Uh, that is the eastern China. Here uh, we can see that uh, our improved E3SM model, that is the red line, uh, generally captures the uh, the size distribution, a particle size distribution smaller than 100 nanometer, while the simulations without without NPF, that is the blue line, generally misses these small particles. The new model, uh, based on the new model, uh, we find that uh, uh, the um, amine plus sulfur acid NPF pathway absolutely dominates near the surface uh, of eastern China uh, uh, among all NPF pathways. This is consistent with recent observational studies. And an uh, interesting finding is that uh, this uh, NPF pathway does only um, is un only plays an important role within a very small height range because of the uh, short lifetime of a mean. About a 500 meter, the uh, sulfur acid and the ammonium uh, MPF uh, takes over as the dominant MPF pathway. And finally, uh, we, uh, we il illustrate the MPF mechanisms all over the world. Uh, we can see that the pure organic uh, NPF dominates in the tropical upper troposphere, and the organic plus sulfur acid pathway dominate as slight, at slightly lower altitudes over the tropics and the mid latitudes. And the, the amine plus uh, sulfur acid pathway dominates near the surface of the mid latitudes. Then uh, I'll continue you to uh, investigate the second question, the formation mechanisms of SOA in typical environments. Uh, for this uh, purpose, uh, we employ a similar model framework as the, as the last section uh, based on the 2D VBS, but here we consider a much wider range of precursors and also consider the multi-generational oxidation chemistry. Uh, for uh, we will see, we simulate the initial oxidation explicitly based on known chemistry and simulate the subsequent multi-generational aging chemistry within the 2D VBS. And we also consider uh, non-traditional precursors, uh, that is uh, the intermediate semi uh, 
intermediate, semi, and low volatility organic compounds, IVOC, SVOC, and XLVOC. And we simulate their multi-generational uh, oxidation chemistry within the 2D VBS. And we also developed optimized parameterizations within the 2D VBS based by simulating a series of laboratory experiments. Uh, besides the model developments, recently we developed a novel organic emission inventory covering the entire volatility range. The traditional organic even emission inventory uses a binary method that considers only PoA and VOC. Uh, in the new inventory, we use we use data we use a species level emission measurements made by GCGC mass and the PTR TOF mass. Uh, to estimate the organic emissions in each and every volatility bin. This fills the gap of a lot of missing SVOs and IVOs in, in the traditional inventory. Uh, the new model and inventory has uh, significantly improved the simulations of OA and SOA compared with predictions using more traditional model and inventories. And uh, improved model inventory uh, uh, allows us to more accurately understand the sources of OA and, and SOA in China. Uh, we can see that uh, all the four precursor groups considered here are important contributors to uh, OA concentrations. For SOA, we can see that uh, I, I will say it's the largest source contributing 46 percent. We will say contributes a slightly smaller fraction of 38 uh, percent. Then in terms of economic sectors, we, we find that uh, 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 the volatile chemical products, VCP, domestic combustion, and biomass open burning are the three top SOA contributors. And compared with the uh, predictions using traditional model and inventory, uh, uh, the SOA contributions from these sectors uh, are increased by a factor of two to nine. Uh, this has greatly reshaped the understanding of the sources of SOA. Then uh, we'll continue to investigate the second question, the factors governing the impact of aerosols on deep convective and ice clouds. By digging, into, by digging into 11 years of satellite data, uh, here we first identified uh, uh, one of the important uh, factors, that is convective strength. Uh, we find that for deep convective clouds and the uh, convection generated ice clouds, the ice crystal size, REI, decreases with increasing AOD and the strong convection, but increases with AOD and the moderate convection. And the, re the relationships are very similar for both dust and the polluted continental aerosols. To uh, illustrate the mechanisms behind this phenomenon, we conducted cloud resolving simulations using the Wolf model with spectral, spectral beam microphysics. And the results point to the K rule of ice nucleating particles, INP. Uh, specifically, uh, we, we, uh, the opposite IEI aerosol relationships and their different convective strengths can be produced uh, 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 only if uh, the INP concentrations are high and also proportional to the total aerosol concentrations that is, that is shown by the red line. In this case, the INP causes the competition between heterogeneous and homogeneous ice nucleation thus leading to opposite IER aerosol relationships under different uh, convective strengths. Uh, given the model-based findings, uh, uh, so the, the satellite observed uh, IER aerosol relations for the polluted continental aerosols indicate that uh, the a portion of the polluted continental aerosols can serve as INP. Otherwise, the relations uh, under moderate convection would be reversed. In addition, uh, considering that dust has been widely accepted as effective INP, 
the similar relations for dust and polluted continental aerosols uh, further corroborate our conclusion. Uh, furthermore, we, we find that the impact of aerosols on clouds are also modulated by cloud types and aerosol types. Uh, for example, uh, we, we show that uh, the optical thickness of convective core generally decreases with increasing AOD, but the thickness of uh, uh, convection generated ice clouds uh, first increases and then st stabilizes with increasing AOD. This is probably because aerosols invigorate convection and uh, detrain more uh, ice crystals to the envelope. And the in situ formed ice clouds are uh, even more different since the, its optical thickness keeps increasing rapidly with increasing aerosol loading. Then uh, in terms of uh, the aerosol types, we, we, we find that smoke has an opposite effect on convection generated ice clouds than other aerosol types because of its light absorption characteristics. And finally, uh, we, we, we find that different aerosol types can also have quite different impact on deep convective precipitation. Uh, dust and polluted continental aerosols uh, generally enhances deep convective precipitation, but smoke generally inhibits it. Uh, so this is consistent with the previous findings for uh, clouds. Finally, so I, I will quickly summarize a few key points from uh, today's talk. Uh, we developed new model schemes to simulate MPF and SOA, uh, which substantially improved the model performance. And we elucidated the main mechanisms of MPF in different regions of the world and uh, their impact on CCN. And we also clarified the main sources of SOA in China. And finally, we uncovered a few key factors modulating the impact of aerosols on deep convective and the ice clouds and the associated, associated precipitation. These factors include uh, the convective strength, aerosol type, and the cloud type. And uh, we also uh, showed that uh, polluted continental aerosols contain a considerable fraction of INP. Uh, so this is all my talk. Uh, I, I would like to uh, thank the AGU Global Environmental Change Section and uh, all my uh, collaborators for their contribution. Thank you for your thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much for that talk. I've been to Beijing and I've experienced that pollution. So. Um, we look forward to having your work really improve some of these serious questions about the atmosphere because that seems to be, as you pointed out, a really big unknown. Um, so uh, before we go on to questions, we're going to go on to our uh, our second speaker today. And so on behalf of both uh, Andy Dessler and myself, we just want to congratulate now Charlie Colvin for his uh, the, the Peter Sellers Global Environmental Change Mid-Career Award. And um, uh, Charlie's in, from the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Berkeley, and he's known for his research on the biogeochemistry, the interactions of the ecosystems and climate, and especially in his pioneering work in permafrost and multi-layer soil carbon uh, modeling. So um, uh, congratulations, um, and we look forward to your talk today, Charlie. Thanks so much, Julie. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, thanks and thanks everybody. Um, I uh, so I'm going to talk today uh, about what, what I'm calling the, the long tail of the carbon cycle, um, permafrost and big trees and changing world. So I guess typically people don't talk about sort of permafrost and big, particularly tropical forest trees and the, the same thing, but I think they represent kind of a, an interesting um, case study in, on 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 this sort of long long term, long time scale dynamics of the carbon cycle. And I want to thank um, all of my colleagues, uh, uh, those listed here, um, as well as the many, many other uh, colleagues who um, make all this work possible. Um, and yeah, so I, I want to start off, let's see, is this, um, I want to start off 
you know, so this is the uh, Peers Sellers uh, Mid-Career Award, and I just want to start off by talking about Peers um, and how meaningful it is uh, to have an award uh, named for him. Peers was was always kind of a, kind of a legend. This uh, this photo here was. Um, his name is an for those who don't know, Pierce was both a scientist and an astronaut. Um, so he's really one of the developers of land surface modeling. This figure here on the left is from his, you know, just now sort of foundational 1986 uh, paper uh, just showing the, the SIB, the simple biosphere model, um, and sort of a schematic of, of how that was uh, designed. And, and I'll come back to that picture or that figure. In the middle is, you know, sort of his 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 photo as an astronaut. And this was, I remember this photo was sitting on my, my PhD advisor, Inez Fung, um, on her desk, you know, because they, they were very close friends and colleagues. Um, uh, uh, you know, throughout my PhD, and so he was always sort of a bit of a legend to me. And then, uh, you know, I was lucky enough, he appears invited and organized a, a meeting probably about 10 years, a little less than 10 years ago now at, at NASA Goddard on permafrost stuff. And I, and, I, and I went there, and since I was there, you know, I had young kids at the time, so I sort of dutifully went to the gift shop and bought some, some you know, NASA swag for, for my kids, and, and one of which I saw, that, you know, the patch for, for, for the, for the um, space shuttle mission, you know, here's, uh, as an astronaut, he helped to build the International Space Station. Um, and so, I, you know, I bought the, one of the patch for his space shuttle mission. I was like, hey, you know, Pierce, can, can you autograph this for me? And I was realizing, you know, that, like, there aren't a lot of scientists who have actually asked their autograph. I think there's actually two Pierce and, and, uh, uh, Ed Lorenz for his book, uh, so it, it puts beers in, in pretty good company. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to say how, how meaningful it is uh, to 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 get this award uh, uh, named after Piers. Um, so, anyway, I want to go back to this picture here on 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 the um, the. Uh, you know the, the sort of schematic of of the world in in land surface models as of 1986, so you know 35 years ago, and 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 I love this picture because it kind of shows this like very sort of leaf centric view of the world. Right, you've got this tree with just this giant, you know, interleaf, you know, uh, inter uh, leaf, you know, airspace cavity, um, sort of dominating the world, right? And 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 and. I would argue that this is still kind of, you know, the 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 land surface modeling community has hewn very close to this view of the world, you know, in the past 35 years. That things are very, um, you know, leaf centric, and that's good, right? I mean, it's important. Leaves are super important; they govern everything. Um, but you know, I guess what I want to talk about here is kind of the other side of things, right? Um, and 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 sort of the long tail. Uh, of you know, if you think about you know a carbon atom, you've got you know inputs in, into some pool, and then you know over time, um, you know the, the the amount of that carbon that's left there, right, is is sort of this this long decay, right? So you the, the carbon is going to pass through you know leaf you know fast tissues like leaves into slower tissues like branches and boles of trees into even slower tissues then as it moves from the live pools to the dead pools of of litter and soil, right? So and ecosystems are characterized by this this continuous cascade of pools with, with an just incredibly wide distribution of turnover time, the orders of magnitude, um, you know, from just the sugars and leaves of with time scale of days to, you know, really um, long-term carbon, uh, you know, long-lived carbon pools and soils with time scales of hundreds or thousands of years. So enormous range of magnitudes. Um, and I, so I want to start here by talking, you know, about these two, what, what I'm calling the, 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 the sort of the long tail and, and, and just sort of break, um, start by focusing off on, on, on the soil carbon. And so on the left, um, we've got a map of the, of the total soil carbon and the inputs to this, you know, the net primary productivity, which you know inputs effectively to soil carbon because you know as trees die, that carbon kind of ends up, or as plants die, that carbon ends up in the soils. And so, if you think of soil of, of the soil carbon as being you know roughly in steady state, then the ratio of those two things becomes a turnover time. So on the right here, I've got a map of you know this like really simplified version of of what is soil carbon turnover time to you know to one meter of of soils um, around around the and if you if you then instead of, you take that exact same data that's on the right, but plot it now in, in terms of the mean annual air temperature instead of as a map form, you see the kind of this big blob of of, of points around the world. It then starts to tell you something about the climate control on on turnover time of soil carbon. Um, and, and there's a lot you can do with that, right? So you can, you know, color these dots by this precipitation. If you do that, you see that there's kind of um, these these distinct populations of, of of soil carbon turnover times at any given temperature, right? You've got in the tropics, you know, high temperatures, you've got this kind of um, wet wet soils with relatively fast turnover times, and then kind of moving up to drier soils. The turnover time, you know, in, in warm environments, kind of move de decreases um, as you moved from wet to dry. Um, and you can kind of see a similar pattern in higher latitudes, but of course, at higher latitudes, there's not that much precipitation anywhere. Um, and so there, there, there ends up being, you know, a, a bit of correlation between the, the precipitation and the temperature. Um, but then you could do the same thing and color these dots then by the soil carbon, right? And, and what you see is like these, these kind of two trends in the, in the climate controls 
of, of turnover. There's the you know aridity gradient towards towards deserts in, in warmer climates, and then temperature gradients towards the permafrost, right? Um, and in the kind of limit per condition of productivity becoming small, right? Because in both cases, you move from tropical forest to desert, productivity becomes small at the same time the turnover times increase. And ditto happens as you move from warm to cold climates, right? But in the limit condition of productivity becoming small and then turnover becoming large along these two gradients, only one of them do you actually find a lot of carbon, right? You can imagine living in a world where there's a ton of carbon in the desert, but that's actually not the world we live in, or, the, the, or at least organic carbon. Um, the, the, you know, in the world we actually live in is that there's a ton of organic carbon at high latitudes, right? And so that um, what it tells you is that, is that you know, there's this very strong temperature control um, of, of, of turnover times as you move towards, uh, towards the high latitudes. Um, and 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 so you only have really high soil carbon, organic soil carbon, um, in, in, in as you move towards these 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 colder climates. Um, and then to switch gears again and sort of talk about the the, the, the sort of dual um, topic of this, I want to talk about you know trees too also have this property, right, uh, uh, or a similar property, which is that for trees, um, the the particularly in tropical forests now, um, most of the biomass is in a very small set of trees, the 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 one percent, the one percent of largest trees, right, um, and 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 so and therefore you know the oldest trees, and so like like soils, you know the 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 the, the majority of carbon in trees is in this kind of longest lived pool of the oldest trees. And so, um, you know, because most of the carbon of, on earth is in these tails of this distribution, you know, we really need to focus on what's going on there um, and, 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 and think about this, you know, the special dynamics that govern these longest lived pools um, uh, in order to understand, you know, what's gonna happen under global change. Um, and, you know, and I should say, you know, this is sort of an obligatory figure or type of figure in, in any kind of talk about carbon cycle feedbacks is that, you know, the uncertainty on, on, on these carbon cycle feedbacks remains enormous, right? The, particularly on the land, um, more so than the ocean. And if you, you know, if you, if you think that Earth system model, you know, ensemble spread is a good estimate of our uncertainty, um, that it's both very wide on land and also not really narrowing very much from, you know, successive generations of, of, of Earth system models. And so this is a, you know, really important problem to understand understand, you know, what's going on here, um, you know, is are, are the system models that we have, are they even an accurate distribution, you know, estimate of, of these kinds of feedbacks, or are they kind of too focused on these faster pools um, and, and maybe missing some of these dynamics at, at, the, at the longer time scales? Um, so with that, I, uh, I want to dive a little bit more into, into first permafrost and then big trees uh, in, in, in a changing world. Um, and so I want to talk first about like the, you know some of the some of the soil carbon dynamics of these permafrost soils. So there's um, uh, Jen Harden and 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 myself and a, and a bunch of uh, collaborators now a, a while ago um, you know put together this compilation of vertical profiles of soil carbon at high latitude soils in these three orders. So on the left are histel soils, so basically frozen peat so, uh, soils. In the middle are cryoturbated uh, permafrost soils, so basically soils where freeze thaw processes actually have physically mix um, uh, soil carbon from the surface down into depth. Um, and then on the right is our, 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 our permafrost soils that don't have either peat or cryoturbation. And because of the really wide distribution of these cryoturbated soils and the fact that, they, that they're able to mix um, carbon from the surface down into the permafrost, they actually end up being you know, the, the, the largest um, amount of carbon in, in, in the high latitude system. So this process of, of, of cryoturbation of mixing carbon down into depth, where, uh, into, into permafrost, where it then gets locked in, trapped in, frozen in the soils, um, and, and, and uh, is, is, is then there you know, in, the event, in the event that these soils might thaw, uh, moving you know, under global warming, ends up being you know, really important uh, because they're both very carbon rich and also very wide. Spread. They're, they're less carbon rich than peat soils, frozen peat soils, but because the peats um, cover a much smaller fraction of the, of the Arctic, the, the cryoturbated ones are actually the, the largest um, pool. Um, and so I want to go back now to this to this um, sort of dynamic uh, this 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 picture that I showed before in the, in the intro. And now I've sort of gotten rid of all the soils that are either too wet because they're they're peat or they're too dry. Um, you know, they're sort of these these arid desert soils. And if you do that, if you get rid of the soils that are either too wet or too dry, then what's kind of left is is you know something that's that's closer to just the temperature control in these turnover times. And the crucial point that um, that that, that I, I want to raise, if you, if if you look at this, is that is that there's a curvature to this population, right? So because we've got log 
you know, a log scale on the on the y-axis and, and a linear scale on the x-axis, and we tend to think about um, the, the the kinetics of soil carbon decomposition as like a first-order process. Um, if there were if this were linear in, in in this kind of space, then you'd assume that there'd basically be a temperature, you know, a constant temperature sensitivity and, and a constant exponential temperature sensitivity in that space. Um, but it's not. It, it, it you know it's it's very clearly curved, and so that says that the, that the temperature sensitivity in this kind of exponential sense is also um, is also a function of the temperature itself, and and with a higher sensitivity um, a, as things get get colder. And so this this fact that the sensitivity, um, you know, which is basically you know the 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 derivative of this curve here, is itself a function of the temperature, is is a really important feature of 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 of, of the carbon cycle of, of soil carbon, and and something that isn't actually totally straightforward to get um, correct in Earth system models, even though it it seems like you know a pretty sort of obvious thing, but it's um, it, 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 there, I think there's a bit more to it, and and and, and I want to get into why I think this this sort of the, this scaling and, and and what the processes are that, that cause this this um, sensitivity of the temperature sensitivity to to to, to climate, um, and you can do this by by creating like a really simple kind of null hypothesis model. Um, and 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 so in the simple model, I'm basically going to assume. Okay, let's let's assume that there's a fixed temperature sensitivity, so an exponential temperature sensitivity using this notation of a Q10, which is basically saying that there's you know the temperature raised to some power, um, and, and that, in this case, that power would be 1.5. Um, uh, is it was sort of a commonly used temperature sensitivity, which effectively sets the slope in 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 this space um, of of the turnover time. And if you do that, and then you put that into a land surface model. You, so the blue line is actually the, the, the you know just the, simply the, the the turnover time evaluated using the mean annual air temperature. If you actually then propagate it through a land surface model, you actually get a bit of an offset. So the temperature sensitivity is actually less than linear. And the reason why you'd get a less than linear sensitive temperature sensitivity is because um, snow insulation effects. Basically, snow causes um, the soils to, to be warmer than the mean annual air temperature because snow is an insulator that's there only in the winter. So it sort of insulates, you know, blanket soils in the winter when things are cold, and then it's not there in the summer uh, when things are warm. And so it actually causes the soil, mean annual soil temperature to be warmer than mean annual air temperature. So you can see right off the bat that, like, we can reject this really simple model of, of, a, of a linear temperature sensitivity. Um, then, uh, you know, you might ask, okay, well, Maybe you know there's there's a special thing that happens when soils freeze and 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 at the sort of most extreme version of that you could say well what happens if decomposition stops entirely when soils are frozen so you know there's some temperature sensitivity in unfrozen soils and then when things freeze we just assume that everything stops entirely um, and if you do that but using that now just the, the near surface soil temperature you kind of get rid of this offset because the snow temperature the snow effects and the insulation of that but you don't actually um, get you know recover something that looks like it has the right curvature. Um, there's st it's still insufficiently insensitive when things are frozen, even if you make the, the strongest possible assumption, which is that there's absolutely no decomposition whenever anything's frozen. Um, the the what, what what does allow you to actually recover something that looks much closer to the to correct temperature sensitivity is if you do the exact same thing. You say that there's you know some temperature sensitivity when things are thawed. Um, you get, you know, if, again, at the, at, the, at the most extreme case, let's assume that there's no decomposition at all when things are frozen, which obviously isn't correct. Things do, you know, decompose um, at, at a much slower rate when things are frozen, but it is a much slower rate. Um, and then, but 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 what actually allows you to do this is if you then instead of using the near surface soil temperature, if you calculate the 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 the, the mean decomposition rate across soil vertically and then integrate that. Um, which is to say that you know the 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 scaling of of freeze thaw in both volume and time is sort of the critical thing that allows you to understand the temperature controls on you know near surface carbon cycling. So the, you know the top meter, which again is isn't even getting into the problem of what's going on below the top meter, but but it shows you the, the importance of representing the, the the sort of physical scaling of of, of the vertical scale, in this case, the vertical and temporal scaling of freeze and thaw is 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 you know allows you to sort of recover something that looks a bit more more reasonable and realistic in terms of the, the sensitivity of temperature um, to, um, to 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 uh, sensitive decomposition to to temperature and climate. Um, and so then this begs the question, right? So what what's going to happen to to carbon in these soils if warming causes permafrost to thaw, right? And if if you think about, you know, on, on so on the left is this is vertical profile of soil carbon, on the right is basically the the thawed season length is a function of depth, right? And so 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 the argument is it's something about this, you know, the integral of this thawed season length with depth. Um, you know, so basically the, the area of that triangle on the right-hand side 
Um, you know, and, and, and the question is, you know, as, as we warm the climate, we expect both, you know, the, the, long, the thawed season to be longer at surface as well as to deepen, you know, the, 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 the permafrost where, where there's any thawed season at all to then deep or, or you know, to, to, to be uh, less, right? The, the active layer will, 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 will um, thaw down into the permafrost. And so we expect, you know, something like, you know, a, a, a possibly a very large change in, this, in, in the area of this triangle um, under warming. And so, the, you know, this is sort of the key question. You know, if this, if this is the approach in a kind of static sense, what are the, what are the dynamics of this uh, look like? Um, so then, you know, in order to ask this question in a more dynamic sense, we need to actually build, you know, a, 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 a model that's, that, 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 that gets these dynamics. So, so here what we've done is, is, is effectively extended the sort of classical soil carbon models um, that, you know, exist in all Earth system models um, that, are, that, 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 that treat things as just, an, you know, a, a set of ODEs where, where, where um, you know, there's soil carbon that exists at some nominal depth, uh, but only one sort of pool of soil carbon at one fixed depth to something that's more of a PDE where we, we actually resolve both the, 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 the vertical distribution and, and dynamics of soil carbon uh, and, and as well as other biogeochemistry um, as a function of depth and how that interacts with these dynamics of, of, of changing permafrost, you know, soil physics and temperature uh, and the permafrost depth over time. Um, and so we have inputs, we've got a mixing, you know, we've got a vertical profile term and we've got a mixing term. Um, and then, and, and sorry to be showing all these equations, but you know, um, the, 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 the key thing here is that we then, in, in, in this sort of model, what we do then is take, okay, well, we've got a, you know, a, a kinetic term that is modified by this temperature sensitivity, and then these other three sort of environmental terms, and one of which is the, the, the matrix potential of unfrozen water. Um, and, 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 and that matrix potential of unfrozen water basically is, gets you the freeze-thaw process. Basically, when soils um, freeze, the, the, the water, you know, the li liquid water sort of basically disappears, they become very dry. And so that's, that's the, the freeze-thaw discontinuity. And it's not, a, it's not a complete discontinuity, but it's a reasonably abrupt one happens through this major potential. And then we've got these other ones for depth and oxygen uh, supply and demand. And just to say that, you know, to go back to, to, to the space that, we, that I showed earlier, you know, if, if you take a model, just a one, a one layer model, like, like the CLM4 model, which is in the, fir, the community Earth system model one, um, and you plot that in the space, again, you see that it doesn't, it doesn't respect the scaling. Whereas when you do this vertical scaling uh, and, and treat it as a, as a PDE, then you actually get something that's, that, even though you don't actually change the intrinsic temperature sensitivity, you get something that, that respects the scaling much, much better uh, and seems much more, uh, much more reasonable um, de depiction of the world. Um, so then what happens to that, to that if you, you know, if you then propagate that forward under, you know, a super high warming. So here I'm taking it under the RCP 8.5. So crazy high emissions out to 2300. So, you know, basically a, a world that hopefully uh, none of us, none of our descendants will ever live to see, but nonetheless useful for trying to understand some of these dynamics. Um, and, the, and, and I've got sort of the vertical time profiles averaged over the whole permafrost region for each of these things. Um, the temperature scalar, the moisture scalar, the oxygen scalar, then the product of them. And the key thing that I want to show here is that the moisture scalar does a really interesting thing that, that the temperature scalar doesn't, right? Temperature scalar, it gets warmer everywhere, so that's not that interesting. The moisture scalar does a thing where it actually goes, the vertical profile of it flips. Um, and, you know, because we're talking about permafrost, initially the deep soils are all frozen, and so there's very little liquid water. But then after things warm, the deep soils actually then become permanently thawed, even though on the surface they still freeze every winter. And so the vertical profile of the controls on these things actually flip. And so the carbon that was locked in at depth before is now super mobile. Um, and, and so the product of them also then does that, right? And so if you then say, okay, well, what, what, is, what happens if you look at sort of these carbon pathways, what you see is, so here I'm showing um, the, the, the retreat of the permafrost boundary and then the, the retreat, the loss of soil carbon that goes along with that. So you get this just enormously massive um, uh, loss of permafrost carbon that then um, continues out in, in, into, you know, in, into the long-term future. So after you lose the carbon, or as and after you lose the, 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 the physical permafrost, the, 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 the carbon um, comes out longer. And so this is, this is a process that's effectively missing or has been missing for most of the Earth system models um, to date. Um, it's something that we, you know, we've put into, in, into, a, into a couple models now, um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and it's important. It you know, really changes the dynamics. Um, and okay, so now I want to switch gears and talk about like big trees, which is you know again a, a big change, but I think there's there's an important um, sort of parallels between these two things. Um, and so as I said before, big trees have this property that most of the carbon is in the you know is in or, or trees have this property that most of the carbon is in a forest that's in the biomass is in a very small fraction of the largest trees. Um, 
And the other thing that's, that's you know important to know about big trees is that they actually die at elevated rates, both when they're really small and when they're large. So um, Dan Johnson et al. Um, uh, had this uh, important paper showing basically the, the, the probability of dying um, for different classes of trees. And basically there's there's sort of two points in a tree's life when it has an elevated probability of dying, when they're very small and just sort of getting a start and they're starved for light, and then when they get larger. Um, and the process is for why these big trees um, uh, tend to die at these larger, at higher rates when they get larger isn't really super well uh, uh, understood. Um, you know, and, and I think a, a key question is, is um, you know, are, do they die because they're big? Is it something about the, the 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 size of being a tree, or is it something about their age? Is it, you know, they 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 get old, they senesce, um, and 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 like anything, any living organism, they they get you know, as they get old, they they die at, at higher likelihood. Um, and so I just want to you know, hear. So this is this is a paper um, led by uh, uh, Jesse Needham, uh, who was a postdoc at, at LBL, and, and now she's a, a project scientist at LBL. Excuse me, a, a research scientist at LBL. Um, and, and and looking at asking a really simple question, right? It, under elevated CO2, we expect trees to grow faster. Um, what ha, what ha, how does this this the sensitivity of large trees um, to to mortality actually affect the 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 the, the response of, of forest carbon to, to increase growth with elevated CO2? Um, and in particular, it, it this question of do big trees die at higher rate because they're big or because they're old? If we just put in two sort of end member ideas of that, um, how does that control the the, the carbon cycle responses of, of tropical forests um, as they grow faster? And so the tool here we're using is the functionally assembled terrestrial ecosystem model, which is basically uh, it's a demographic model um, that includes um, you know a, a bunch of sort of features. Basically, it shifts the 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 key you know thing that it's modeling from a forest canopy to the actual trees that that comprise that canopy. Um, and 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 there are a few sort of important properties. Of this. So this is showing like an, an example of if you if you if you took a snapshot of a forest every year for 600 years and you lined up all the trees from tallest to shortest um, uh, and sort of grouped similar sized trees into cohorts, this is kind of what that would look like. And so here we've got these two different PFTs competing against each other. And the key thing is that is that there's a conservation law here, um, which is called the perfect plasticity approximation. And the conservation law is that trees will occupy the canopy um, based on their height. Um, that the canopy is effectively always occupied. So as trees grow, they kind of push each other out of the canopy. So the tall trees push short trees out of the canopy. Um, and so this ends up being a, you know a, a really important sort of you know conservation law when you when you recast um, you know the the dynamics of, of of ecosystems around individual trees rather than you know a, as the forest as a whole. Um, and and so. What what Jesse did here is to add a parameterization for elevated mortality rates when plants are either old, large or old, right? So you can assume the plants are going to die at an elevated rate either when they're large or when they're old, and ask, okay, now if we increase the, the growth rate of trees, what happens if you do that? Um, and so and so here, yeah, so when when growth rates increase, the, the mortality rates are going to respond differently depending on whether the size, the, that elevated large tree mortality is size or age. So so you know if if, if uh, and so you can imagine sort of this, you know, this mortality rates can either shift as a function of, of diameter will will either shift from left to right um, if 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 uh, if it's age related mortality uh, as a function of the diameter because trees are going to be growing faster. So if they're if it's age related mortality, then they'll get to a larger size before they die. Whereas if it's if it's uh, size driven mortality, then then if you think about it as, as a function of the cohort age, then they'll die. Um, at a younger age, because they'll achieve that larger size faster under elevated CO2, right? And this is holding everything else constant. This isn't getting into the issue of, you know, the drought sensitivity of large trees under a changing climate and how that might change. This is holding everything else constant. Just thinking about purely this demographic aspect and the fact that we expect trees to grow faster because of elevated CO2. And so, if you do that. Um, the 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 and then you you, you so we, we now increase the growth rates by 25% and then do a sort of this long-term simulation, um, and and so the 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 basal area and above ground biomass both you know are both increased in response to elevated productivity, but the key thing is that the change of, of that basal area and above ground biomass is going to be 50% smaller if that large tree mortality um, is is because the plants are large size rather than old. Right. So if there's something fundamental about this being large, um, in terms of you know, in that it that it creates mechanical stresses on trees, you know, makes expose them to wind stresses, creates um, hydraulic stresses because you've got to get 
you've got to move they've got to move water you know from the soil to the canopy of the trees if it's something fundamental to the size of a tree that causes these large trees to die faster then we expect a half of having of the of the biomass response to elevated co2 holding everything else constant just because of that just because of the fact that these largest trees um are are, are dying would be dying because they're small then then if it's you know a, a senescence thing if it's, if it's age-related senescence then then, 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 then you get you know something that's that as if as if there was no large tree elevated mortality at all, and the turnover time response to this ends up also being you know you can see this there too where basically in the short term and the short term here is you know 50 to 100 years under all cases you get a reduction in the turnover time and that be, happens because of the the kind of pushing of large trees large trees pushing small trees out of the canopy and killing them faster by light competition uh, under all cases but then as things tend to equilibrate and shift towards a new new equilibrium you get two very different equilibria depending on 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 the, the this demographic property of whether these large trees are dying because they're large or because they're old right and so the, this ends up you know this is something we, we, we don't really have a good handle over what what actually governs the demography of these large trees you know what actually causes these these large tree, uh, mortality rates um, but you know we do see that like observations actually do suggest that something something possibly like this is going on right so this is now classic paper by Brianna and now using forest uh, census data throughout the Amazon show that yeah okay productivity has been going up historically um, but mortality has been also going up related you know in, in related way and and we don't know is that, is that increased mortality rate because of you know increased droughts with climate change is it because of 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 this sort of light competition and the fact that with trees growing faster they're going to you know kill their younger neighbors younger and smaller neighbors faster um, by pushing them into the understory or is it because of some of these demographic things of just large trees being more sensitive um, and so we you know understanding why this is going on um, to, to the extent to which it's being driven by climate change versus uh, growth you know internal ecosystem dynamics is, is really crucially important um, so I want to end there you know again this is the, the point of talking about you know permafrost and large trees in the, in the, at the same time is is obviously they're, they're they're important differences but the point is that you know uh, um, there are so many questions out there um, related to these kind of long tails of the carbon cycle right? most of the world's car terrestrial carbon is in these kind of long tail of these turnover times the things that control these long tails are really different from most of the fluxes um, you know two of these are, are permafrost and big tr big old trees um, and, and the processes that govern the cycling of these old troll, these old pools, such as permafrost thaw, you know, are, and, and, and the life cycling of trees are critical for, for understanding these carbon feedbacks, and they're still missing from most of our system models, right? And, and, and if we think about these dynamics more, um, they may really substantially change our idea of, of what is actually governing these carbon cycle feedbacks. So if you add permafrost in, into Earth system models, you basically change the nature of the carbon climate feedback there from a sink to a source of warming. Um, if you add this dem demographic response to elevated growth, uh, uh, under under elevated CO2, you actually can reduce the biomass sink from CO2 fertilization by 50%. Right, so these are like big kind of first order things that we're just we're, we're barely considering in Earth system models right now. Um, and, and I guess I just want to end with you know this 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 uh, you know really we need to focus um, more on, on these types of processes that govern these large slow carbon pools in order to better quantify the carbon cycle feedbacks. Um, and so with that, I will end, uh, acknowledge my sponsors, the DOE uh, BR, and uh, we can end and, and take questions. Thanks. All right, thanks very much for that. Thanks to both of our speakers today. Um, so now we have uh, about, uh, let's call it 10 minutes to have uh, some questions. Um, I'm gonna ask, uh, maybe Hannah can, or uh, Yuan, if there are any questions from the chat. Um, Judy, I will... right, now, right now, I haven't seen any questions. Probably people are still typing them in, but if Andy or you have some like questions to 